Okay, well, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, thanks to IST for hosting this event. IST is a non-partisan, non-profit network based in the Bay Area that uh, bridges national security, policymakers, and tech innovators and brings them together to advance solutions for the world's toughest security threats, uh, which is obviously extremely important right now. And we've got a great session here. We've got three wonderful speakers uh, who I was just getting to know. So the first one is Sarah Sewell, who is the Executive Vice President for Policy at Inkytel. She can tell us more about that. Um, second, we have Corey Shaki, who is the Director of Foreign Policy and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. I think I pronounced the name correctly. I, I did beforehand. Um, and uh, last but not least, we have Bilal Zubari, who is uh, leads in investments in a number of companies, uh, too many to list, to be honest, at Lux Investments. Um, so welcome to our three speakers. Let's um, let's get straight into it. So um, the first thing I wanted to ask is really what what existing structures in government and private industry can be leveraged to uh, in both improve technological innovation and um, but also what new kind of structures should be created. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with Sarah since I mentioned her first. And obviously you can tell us a bit about your unique experience in, in this area with Inkytel. Sure, well, thanks. So I think that the US has typically thought about research and development in a Cold War context. And that was you fund research and development that's useful for the military or for the government as a large, but it started up as being the military predominantly in the Cold War. It goes into the military procurement process. And everything else on that research and development platter can be picked over by the entrepreneurial the private sector and turned into commercial applications. And that combination served the United States well for a long, long time. But with the end of the Cold War, um, we now have a very different competitor in the form of China. And China is interested in competing in commercial technologies and in using commercial technologies in ways that advance its national security interest, its hard power and its soft power. And that's very different from the Soviet Union, which was completely decoupled from the US economy. Here we are in a globalized economy and we have a competitor that's really sort of barreling in into commercial technologies and convinced that technology is gonna be sort of its ticket to become the leading power around the globe. So, we have to adjust the way we've thought in the United States about the relationship between the private sector and government. We have to adjust the way we've thought about the pipeline of supporting innovation and expand it beyond just R&D and then it gets you know, sucked up into the, the DOD vortex. Really think more about how do you move R&D in areas of foundational technology like synthetic biology or microelectronics, how do you move those technologies on the commercial side all the way through into a minimum viable product and then into successful companies. And so in short, the answer to your question is, we don't have a huge number of vehicles that do that for the commercial side. And that's where we need to develop them. InQtel, where I work is one such entity. It only works at the very early stage of financing. The, the Development Finance Corporation works at the late stage of financing, but it's not interested in national security per se. It's focused on development and it's focused on helping, you know, American companies meet emerging technology needs in the developing world. So we can expand on those two existing entities or we can try to create new entities that are really focused on nurturing the commercial tech that we need only where it won't be funded by the private sector. Obviously, you don't want to duplicate what the private sector does really well. But in those areas where the, the capital requirements are really high or the return on investment is not sufficient or not in a fund time frame, we're going to need the government to recognize that where it matters for national security can be more than what it typically understood and that the US government's going to need to step in in a role to try to push it all the way through the pipeline so that American companies can continue to do what they've done so well over the past you know, many decades, which is, you know, compete and be at the leading edge globally. Sorry, um, Corey, would you agree with that, that position? I do that? agree with that. I think I would make the argument even more stridently than Dr. Sewell, though, that, um, that the defense establishment is largely inward looking 
despite great efforts like the Defense Innovation Unit, the culture of defense is not one to buy stuff off the shelf and to be knowledgeable about emergent small company activity. And so I think in addition to the change that, you know, a China that's globally connected and a major American challenger brings, uh, which is a huge and important difference from the Cold War. It's also true that the pace of technological innovation in the American economy, thankfully, because it's good for all of us, has dramatically outpaced the technological innovation within the defense ecosystem, in part because of the depth of venture capital investments um, in the US. So DOD's, the government more generally, but especially DOD is most comfortable when it has control over things. And they're still really adjusting to a domestic ecosystem in that is much more open, that's much more connected to the technology space in our major adversary. And, and remember the defining mistake for the defense industrial community in the United States was sometime in the 1950s, uh, the Commerce Department allowing an export license for ball bearings, something so simple, so, but which um, Soviet factories were having a difficult time machining. And the accuracy of Soviet strategic nuclear forces increased dramatically. So there's an enormous hesitance to use and be comfortable in an ecosystem where your potential adversaries have the same access or related access to technology that you have. That makes this really hard. And the second difficulty on top of it is um, the fact that the Biden administration and the Trump administration before it have a very nationalistic approach to technological innovation. They want American companies inventing stuff and American businesses manufacturing it. And that demonstrates a pretty um, shallow understanding of the nature of, of innovation, of global investment and, and supply chains. So there's a huge education component to getting this right. And that education is not just in Silicon Valley, it's also in the government. Um, can I just, I just want to jump on, on that point because I think I think it's incredibly important. And, and you know, um, Sarah was talking about China, which is obviously the, the key um, kind of com competitor here and the industrial policy that China's pursued has, has been established and been going on for a while. And it, this sort of requires quite a big shift in a way. Um, how well do you think that it's, got, it's gone so far? And, and um, how easy is it going to be? Because I, I see such, I see, you know, there are obviously very significant differences in relationships between companies and, and citizens to the, to the government here. So I'm kind of curious about that. Yeah. I think it's gone badly so far for a couple of reasons. The first is the legacy of the Snowden revelations, um, at which I think deeply damaged trust between the tech community and the government. Uh, and the second reason is the clumsy tariff and trade policy of the Trump administration that's being continued in the Biden administration. It's early days, but so far they're leaving the ball where it lies. Um, and we're gonna have to get past both of those two things because it looks to me like there's zero possibility of sustaining American technological dominance without public private cooperation mm -hmm. to a much greater degree than I think either side feels comfortable with now. There are some good international examples. Uh, you know, the way Japan and Australia are trying to move beyond vulnerability in their rare earth supply chains to sole dominance on China. So getting the government to a place where it understands we don't need national control, we need diversity of supply chains and investment portfolios and things like that so that you don't have single point failure, but you build greater resilience into the process. Mm -hmm. um, a white CFIUS process where you 
uh, preemptively approve cooperation between companies uh, that are known and trusted entities. Like there are a lot of practical ways you can do it. We mm. just need to do it. So well, let's let's turn to um, Bilal and you know the view from obviously from someone who's embedded in the, the tech industry in Silicon Valley. And um, I wonder if you see opportunities in this for 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 new forms of innovation. If you if there are things you 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 would like to see done to, to improve innovation and just whether this is something that's coming up when you talk yeah. to uh, company founders so, and so on. So, you know, I, I, it's, you know, it was fascinating to hear the last few minutes because, you know, you know, both, you know, Sarah and Corey are really knowledgeable about this. Um, the, you know, innovation used to be 30 years ago or certainly 50 years ago, innovation used to be the kind of you know, deep tech, high end, you know, high tech innovation used to be done for the military first, funded by DARPA and the first customers of it were, were the military. Um, and then with the military sort of almost signing off on it, it would get used by the commercial sector. So, you know, large corporations would get access to that technology and then eventually consumers, and, you know, even internet the same way, right? Like, but certainly before that, uh, GPS technologies and so on. Um, that cycle has completely inverted itself upside down, right? The, the latest and the greatest technologies are now developed and becoming available to consumers first. And then it becomes available to, you know, enterprises when it's like bring your own device to work uh, and then goes to the military. So a four-star general gets the iPhone six years after you and I could have bought it because they're still using Blackberries up in, until, you know, 2013 and 14. Um, our president was using a BlackBerry, right? Because we thought it wasn't secure enough that they could use an iPhone. Uh, and, and, and you can see that across the board. You know, I mean, think about machine learning, AI and explainability and, you know, synthetic data. It's like all of this stuff is being done real time in all tech companies and military is just like scratching the surface, you know, hey, can we get some facial recognition technologies that we can get access to? Um, so, so there's a very interesting paradigm now where government is in some ways fallen behind and needs to play catch up. The problem mm -hmm. is that I think as, as Corey was saying, this is not how they have operated in the past. <laughs> they're not used to that. They, they're used to owning it. They're used to controlling it, but the, you know, but this cat is out of the bag. Um, mm -hmm. And innovation is not only happening in the, in, in the commercial sector, but it's actually happening globally. Um, Venture capitalists and, and, and technologists actually see a real value in it and, and see real opportunities here. Um, and, and, and part of the um, part of the reason is that, you know, look, defense and national security is a very large part of our um, budget, right? I mean, it's a very large industry, very large market, and we want to sell into that. The problem is that the two sides are not used to talking to each other, uh, certainly not over the last 30 years. And, and they're not very good at understanding each other's motivations. I think there's fault lies on both sides. Uh, mm -hmm. Only a few organizations have been able to thread that and Qtel is one of those, right? They've, they've been able to figure out how to have conferences where people are walking around with just first names and no last names. At the same time, talking to technologists who are like, you know, if I don't get sales in the next 18 months, I run out of money because startups are funded on 18 month cycles, right? I mean, they're only given money to last 18 months to two years. So um, the two sides need to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. In the interim, by the way, um, you know, uh, if you look at the last 10 years, China was smart, right? Uh, just using China as an example, you know, they realized that there's a technology industry here that's going fast. Um, government is not paying enough attention to it, if anything, creating a little bit more of an adversarial stance. So they came in in big ways and they invested in companies, they created venture funds to invest in companies. And it's only in the last few years that the tech industry has suddenly picked up and like, wait, what? <laughs> what are we doing and how are we doing this? And, and how do we clean up our, you know, our, our, you know, our, 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 our internal organizations to make sure that we don't have foreign assets embedded inside or we don't have leaking of technology to, to outsiders that are potentially mm -hmm. national security threats. And a little bit of stick and a little bit of carrot approach is being used in that regard. But um, up until a few years ago, China was seen as a massive market that we will go potentially sell into. It's mm -hmm. only in the last two, three years that you know, I would say that the tech industry has said, you know, yeah, maybe Google not being able to operate or Wall Street Journal not being able to sell freely in China Maybe that applies to us too, even though we're just like a 50 or 100 person tech company. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that, that's very true. I, I, I want to pick up on one thing. You know, you, you, you made the point about government and industry not talking to each other or not communicating enough. And I think one, one of the things you said really illustrates it because you were talking about the fact that these um, advances end up maybe in the public sector first. But it's, it's fascinating if you think about the fact that, you know, deep learning, all the, 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 um, the advances that have made uh, facial recognition possible were funded often by government money, right? Maybe, maybe they're in private universities as well, but a lot of government grants. And so there is this kind of, I, I think there's an amazing um, legacy and, and the, you know, the US tech industry is built on top of a lot of the government's kind of, um, you know, spending on, on R&D and so on. But it's, it's very, definitely very sort of disconnected in, in, um, in that way. And so I'm, I, yeah, I, I wonder, you know, as a, as a VC, as a venture capitalist, if you, um, if you could, you can envisage changes that would help maybe um, you, you the, to government more or, or maybe make bets on, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the key issues here as well is that there needs to be bets on technologies that are going, going to be important, right? It's not necessarily the thing that's going to pay off in 16, 18 months. Yeah. So I, I'll say a few things there, right? Like the, the post Second World War, we, we ended up creating these large prime contractors that mm -hmm. were the defense contractors. And they, in fact, operated as utilities. We gave them monopolies or oligopolies. And we said, you know, you will work. We will give you a lot of business, but you will work only for us. Mm -hmm. And you will work on very little margins, you know, like 10 percent cost plus margins. Right. Like so you're not going to ever become a giant business that's very profitable and people don't, you know, People are not going to go there to with the entrepreneurial dream of becoming millionaires and billionaires. It's going to be a great organization. You know, you will have, you know, blue shirts, hockey pants, and you know, a pocket protector, and you'll have a good life. Um, the the problem is that uh, you know when they did that, those those became sort of staid organizations where innovation wasn't very fast. When you tell somebody that I'm going to pay you on a cost plus basis. And if I'm an, an enterprising guy, what do I do? I make the cost very high, right? Like I put butts in seats, the more but, put, butts I put in seats, the more I get paid. So my programs that I pitch to you are going to be 10 year, $10 billion programs. To counter that, government started this program of, you know, essentially SBIR programs. So they got lots and lots of small grants given out, lots and lots of small companies. But the middle completely got left out. Mm -hmm. so there was this innovation, I, I like to sometimes, you know, jokingly and lovingly call it the innovation theater that got created that, hey, we give out a lot of money to a lot of companies, right? You know, we have like, you know, 100,000 grant here or a million dollar grant here. And what you ended up creating was a whole bunch of companies that I'm sure some of them were doing really important national security work, but a whole bunch of them were just like R&D and R&D and R&D and R&D. Right, mm -hmm. it never got turned into products that could anybody could actually use. Like a soldier could never use one of those products, you know, to, to actually right. use in real life. Right, so the middle got left behind. And I think if you see what's been happening over the last five, ten years, this is where a lot of deep tech innovation is going now. You know, the SpaceX mm -hmm. of the world, like government paid more money to Boeing than it ever paid to SpaceX because it really wanted to pray to God that somehow Boeing will be able to make it work, but they couldn't. And SpaceX mm -hmm. made it work, right? And, and you're seeing the same thing happen in all major industries. You have, you know, drone companies that are all commercial companies that now government is having to go to. They tried forever with their larger companies and they just couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, you're seeing the same thing in autonomous cars, which are now moving into, into use of autonomous vehicles in, for the army. Um, you're going to see the same thing in computer vision. And, and now you're seeing the VR stuff, right? Like Microsoft $20 billion plus order for AR VR goggles program that came out of the private sector. Mm. They tried everything they could to have those utilities innovate. I call them utilities, the, the Raytheons and the Lockheed Martins of the world. Um, and, and they couldn't. That's not what they're built for. You know, American utilities who provide power to you is not innovating. Solar technology didn't come out of, you know, PG&E. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what the government is now starting to realize is we need to create a new system. We need to find all these little bets that we've been making all along. How do we get them to actually grow into bigger companies? And perhaps for many of them, they will need to partner with the primes to, for certain legal reasons and logistical reasons and whatnot, but there needs to be a partnership created. And those mechanisms have not existed. Even in QTEL, you know, we have about two dozen companies who probably partner with in QTEL, 
even Intutel doesn't really have a proper program on how do you scale up these companies, right? Like it's the idea is to find ideal, great companies, great ideas, give them early grants and get them into the program. But it's, you know, it's not easy even for the best operating organization to do that yet. They're building these programs. But I think we need to do that at a national level to realize that while we're not doing it, China's doing it. The CEO of the major corporations or any startup gets a call. He shows up the next day and he says, how many people, what technologies, what do I need to do? We mm -hmm. don't have those programs. I'm not suggesting that we just complete collusion between private and public sectors, but certainly mm -hmm. there needs to be mechanisms by which technologies can be pulled up. Well, I think that's- uh, So yeah, Will, can I, yeah, ahead, can I add to this? So one yeah. of the things that's interesting, and I, and I agree with so much of what Bilal said, but you know, fundamentally there's a difference between a DOD mentality, which is how do I how do I meet my requirements, right? Start with requirements and how do I meet my requirements? And they have a model in which they're trying to reach out to more companies and give more grants and sort of flood the zone at the earlier stage. But as Bilal was saying, it doesn't mean that a lot of them come all the way through, but all of those are aiming at DOD requirements. Mm -hmm. there, there are two different issues with that. One, some of the things that are really important for our nation's security, like the ability for our allies to have secure telecommunications is not a DOD mission set, right? It's a commercial mission set. So mm -hmm. part of what's going on here is that to think about the innovation problem as being just a question of getting DOD what it needs for its requirements is to miss the larger parameter of how competition is evolving with technology. So it's fine if you want to have DOD flood the zone and pull into procurement a bunch of stuff that it needs. And it's great in the cases that were cited where there's also a commercial application like drones or commercial satellite launch or whatever. But there's a lot of stuff that fundamentally the market, DOD is going to be maybe 3% of that market. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have to have different entities outside of DOD thinking about where the risks are where the future vulnerabilities are, where the Chinese are moving, how our allies are gonna have choices or not have choices, what it's gonna mean. And I mean, just take the example, for example, of laying fiber, having a telecommunications backbone, putting on top of it mobile app payments, you know, and at that platform and then turning it, turning it into, you know, digital, digitizing it and where all that information is gonna go and who's leading that charge. And mm -hmm. if China's leading that charge, and that's going to move from Asia through Africa, through Europe. Where's that going to leave the United States? Where in the U.S. government are people having that conversation about the opportunities and risks in the non-DOD space? The last one, I want to come back to something that Dr. Shaki said, which I think is really important, which is that DOD likes to control. And one of the interesting things about the way the debate's unfolding now on Capitol Hill is that we've all gotten religion with the pandemic about supply chain vulnerability, right? We know it from masks and we know it from vaccines and we know it, we've now extrapolated it into other areas that have been more apparent in the national security framework. But securing the supply chain is fundamentally looking backwards. It's fundamentally a conservative mode. It is preserving and duplicating, but it's not the same as innovation. And one of my biggest concerns is that in the desire that, that policymakers in Washington now have to boost US innovation, which is a really important desire, they will rely on their old tools, just putting more into R&D, but not thinking about how it moves through the pipeline to be a viable product or a company, and thinking only about the, the DOD needs instead of thinking about these broader sort of gray zone areas of commercial economic competition that ultimately could determine as much as any military system, sort of where geopolitical competition ends up. No, absolutely. I, I was, I was going to make the, a similar point about the, you know, the discussion right now is around, say, chip making, right, or 5G or telecommunications. These aren't necessarily things that are, they have some DOD um, applications, but they are, they are commercial technologies. So, well, let's talk a little bit about the, the amount of money that, um, well, the, the pledge that the Biden administration has made to to increase R&D. And um, so Corey, if I mean, you could, you could talk a little bit about uh, how do we, you know, how do we make sure that that is spent well and spent in the right way? What are the kind of historical precedents for that being done? I'm not, and it's not to say that China does that well, right? There's an incredible amount of waste in, in the sort of industrial policy that it follows. 
I think we should all resign ourselves to the fact that it is not going to be spent well. That's actually not what American strategy does. What American strategy does historically is dump enormous buckets of resources on a problem and try 37 different things, 35 of which are going to fail. Um, and lo and behold, one or two of them might work. I mean, the, the history of American defense policy certainly is that we're not good at having it right, we're good at getting it right. Mm -hmm. And so a, an enormous strategic advantage for the United States is when adversaries leave us time to panic that we've got it all wrong and can figure out how to do it right. My expectation is that the, the investments are gonna be a huge sloppy mess. And we're all gonna be reading in the newspaper about how you know some congressman, something in their district, it's terrible, it's a waste of money. Why do we spend any government money on this? And the answer is because experimentation is what we actually do well. The government is nowhere near smart enough to be able to pick champions. And Will, to your point, parenthetically, I'm deeply skeptical the Chinese government is actually smart enough to pick champions either. Our advantage is chapter 11 bankruptcy, venture capital investments that capitalize, you know, that outpace the American government spending by so much, um, immigration that brings us talent. It's all that crazy, messy stuff. But the Biden administration's R&D commitments are a really important signal. And that's what matters about them much more than the amount of money or the targeting that's gonna get done with them. But I mean, I'll, I'll, the question I guess then is, are we creating market incentives to, to sort of drive innovation in the right places? And um, I mean, Bilal, it doesn't- Surely not. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there are, this is something that mo most, you know, people working on the next, I was gonna say TikTok, but that's Chinese, so that would be, a mistake, you know, <laughs> but the, how do you get people to, young entrepreneurs to even care about that? Look, uh, so one thing, there's a misnomer or misunderstanding that the young people don't care about things that might be relevant to national security or bigger issues. I think that's absolutely bogus. That's not true. Um, just because Google decided for whatever reasons to not work with the US military does not mean that that's what Silicon Valley is thinking broadly. Um, there are some issues, and, and, and some of those issues are um, that, you know, there's an entire generation of, you know, 20, 30-year-olds that, um, that haven't seen war directly, you know, impact mm -hmm. them, right? They, they were fed for, since their youth, you know, especially, you know, 15, 18 years ago, that globalization is the thing, selling internationally is the thing, this is what America is going to be all about. So they're all about, this is the generation that invented Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and, and, and global economies. And, you know, and now we have, you know, oh my God, BTC might actually impact US dollar hegemony and all of that stuff, right? But this is a generation that was trying to create US um, you know, businesses to extend globally throughout in every single way. This is also the generation that, yes, did TikTok and all of that stuff and Facebook and made money on Twitter and Facebook. But this is also the generation that left PayPal and started, you know, Tesla and SpaceX and, and solar companies and wind power companies. And they're now talking about clean tech and climate tech. And so they're, they're actively involved in this. The problem is that we haven't said them, they, we haven't understood our own entrepreneurial drive and what drives these entrepreneurs well enough to create the right incentive systems. Yeah. Entrepreneurs are not driven because you give, throw them some peanuts to do some research on the side, right? Let's be honest. I mean, all three of us are doctors and PhDs, right? Academics work that way, right? You <laughs> want them to work on certain areas. You put some small dollar amounts that are peanuts and you will see grants all start to move in that direction, right? And, and that's very easy to turn academics into whichever direction you want to go to, broadly speaking, with small dollars. Startups don't work that way, right? You know, the, the phase one of SBIR grants from Air Force were like $50,000, right? Venture capitalists, they're like individuals walking around cafes in Palo Alto that can write that check in 15 minutes of meeting, you, right? And there you have to file, pro, you know, file paperwork to the government and show up and present to get a $50,000 phase one grant from, from Air Force. So we have to understand how do we create 
opportunities for these businesses to scale, right? Rather than giving $400 million grants, if you were to give 10, $40 million contract award, meaning go buy stuff and use it in the fields, you will see people, I will be spending money on my companies to go win those contracts, right? And I think we need to create those mechanisms if we really want companies to put their best foot forward and not apply for these grants. We were going to do this anyways. Let's get some free money on the side and we will submit some paperwork. This is what SBIR program becomes for fast moving companies. It becomes a drag. It becomes this little playground for some, some kind of a CTO to play in. What you really want is for this to be, you can build your business. I think Dr. Sewell was saying that, you know, there'll be some defense use, maybe 5%, 10%, and some will be the dual use, some other uses that there will be in the commercial sector. You have to make sure that the defense sector, even if it's five or 10%, is lucrative enough for me to even include that. You know, it's, you can do the economics very clearly that if I am trying to build a company that, and you can look at all the companies that existed, you know, have done well in the last 10 years, they go from 1 million in revenues to 5 million, to 30 million, to 100 million, to 500 million. Right? I mean, there's some curve. How do I build that if I'm in the government sector? Government sector is do not, you know, nothing, maybe peanuts of 50, 100, $200,000 for like five years, maybe 10 years, and then like a $200 million contract. That step function is just not conducive to the entire entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem that we have built and has been the most successful entrepreneurial ecosystem in the world. We have to adjust that process yeah. to our own system. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the kind of great ironies here, I think, is that um, the the success that the Chinese and I, I don't want to, you know, well, we are focusing on on China. China as a competitor. But the the China's um, tech industry has seen has been basically copying the U.S. approach for for quite a long time, and that's starting to change. And that may that may actually um, some of the some of the kind of new rules are around around that new efforts to kind of pick winners and so on may actually have a detrimental effect effect um, for them but um, that sounds like a very smart idea so um, Dr. Sewell is that is that something that you're you would be in favor of would that work with your with well so control? again I think it's a very DoD con centric conversation and that's the concern I mean DoD DoD can give these massive contracts DoD at least at the end of the day has a huge purse to hold out for its requirements and its SBI R model is just about, you know, thickening the pipeline before they choose who gets the contract. And yes, it takes a long time. And yes, procurement should be streamlined, blah, blah, blah. We've heard this forever. That's mm -hmm. all true. But DOD has more tools than any other part of our system in terms of thinking about some of the technologies that will matter for our national security that are not DOD contract end games, mm -hmm. right? So, so for example, InQtel's whole philosophy is to look at where the, the tech trends are going, look at where we need to be moving and figure out how to, to get some of the most innovative small companies to adapt what they're doing for the commercial market so they can also serve other national security requirements. Mm -hmm. But our fundamental role is not scaling technology as, as Bilal was said, we don't do the big checks to take your company once you validate it and found your you know, market fit. We don't scale you to go international. We do the early exploration. We figure out where do they have a real viable technology? Where do they have a great commercial team that will survive such that the investments that we make today Will, will benefit in the long term and we'll have a reliable supplier for the government in the long term. And how do we leverage? We on lever average leverage about 18 private VC dollars for every dollar we put in to a given early stage investment. How do we leverage and partner with the existing VC ecosystem, which is very efficient and, and, and very, and able to move with alacrity where it sees promise? How do we, how do we create greater incentives for them to join in these areas that are going to be twofers for the nation. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think what Bilal was describing is true, but DOD is way better off than say, you know, who's going to be giving the big contract for, you know, a new open RAN system. Right now we're realizing we need a way to incentivize that, but we don't have an agency that says, that's what I need, build it for me. Because part of the reason why we don't have those components is because of the end to end monopsony that exists globally. And our, our local you know, American ecosystem was different. 
Well, so who, where in the government, is it commerce? You know, is it a new entity within the government is thinking about what our, what our commercial firms need to be able to develop in terms of technology that will meet global needs and have implications for national security? And how do we fund it? How do we take an instrument like an early stage investor, like an Incutel that has serious investing expertise and serious technology expertise can help figure out what you, where you need to be going and doing the building block investments to help small companies ultimately get there. And then how do you build something for the middle and particularly for the scaling later stages of investment to make sure that it goes all the way to full bore success. And if you wanna go earlier in the pipeline, can we do a better job commercializing from R&D from the place where you're flooding academic organizations with lots of grants that they'd love to keep just getting grants to do? And how do you begin to move them into the early prototyping, into a more collaborative relationship with industry? How do you create sandboxes for people to play and move so that then they can get the investment from the Incutel or from the private VC? Mm -hmm. And these are not part of the conversation. We're about to look at, you know, $100 billion bills in Washington, D.C. to flood the research and development pot that, you know, is smaller than it used to be, but is still pretty, pretty vibrant. And we're, we're missing these other pieces. Um, you know, DOD is still going to be able to buy big systems. But what about the things that don't primarily get driven by a DOD contract? Can I make a suggestion there? Um, because I think both Dr. Zuberi and Dr. Sewell brought up the point that there's a whole huge need in the middle and the American government's not positioned, doesn't have the, doesn't have the grappling hooks to get a hold of it. But I do think there's a huge opportunity because uh, Congress appears to be willing to spend money like drunken sailors uh, to build back better. And the Biden administration has a basically buy America approach to a lot of the national security space. And Chinese behavior is going to continue driving that bifurcation. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity, for example, for Susan Rice, the national domestic advisor, um, to have to figure out how do we do this? How do we help American companies scale to the space where um, they're going to be viable to produce the kinds of things we need in the national security space that our defense and national security strategies driving us for that you know all of the rhetoric of build back better can actually be advanced by this mm. well let me let me um i think that's a very good point let me just sort of take a step back and play i don't know devil's advocate a little bit um there's so much rhetoric and so much talk you know off, a lot of it rightly about this idea of, of international competition and, and you know ensuring that the U.S. doesn't fall behind China, but it you, you know um, Dr. Shaka, you just talked about the bifurcation and there's there's you know that's happening quite remarkably. I think I think it wouldn't have been people wouldn't have predicted that it would happen as much as it has, and yet you know the innovation we've seen in the past couple of decades has built really been built on a very global interconnected um, society many connections to China, but elsewhere in the world. And I, I just want to talk a little bit about how we make sure that we don't create these kind of um, ecosystems which are walled off and ultimately means less innovation that things are being replicated or, and, and make sure that things don't happen somewhere that you know we wouldn't necessarily know about. So I'm, I'm, I don't know, um, perhaps Dr. Shaki, you could talk about this. Uh, how, do we, how do we ensure we sort of balance that co um, competition with cooperation? Maybe it's especially with US allies, I guess. So I think you're unlikely to actually be able to balance the competition with China in the national security space. But I would emphasize that's largely driven by China's own behavior, um, right? I mean, the Google example uh, and the Wall Street Journal example that the um, irony is that the assertiveness of Chinese behavior is actually activating the antibodies against their continued success. And so, you know, it's important to remember that, that the American government's vision of a strong, prosperous China that remains mm -hmm. integrated into this ecosystem 
that's where we wanted this to go. The Chinese made a different choice than that or appear to be making a different choice than that. And what we're trying to do is tug them back into behavior that abides by the existing rules. The good news is we have an enormous amount of help in that undertaking, right? The biggest advocates of sustaining the existing globalization and its rules of order are middle powers, and those are almost entirely American allies. Mike Brown, the nominated, the guy nominated by the Biden administration to be undersecretary for, is it science and technology or acquisition? acquisition. One of the big, thank you, one of the big DOD posts, um, you know, has been arguing for several years that if the US and its allies could get a data sharing arrangement, we would actually have the scale uh, that China has for development of AI and machine learning and other things. So there are good strategies for uh, prosperity and cooperation among Japan, Australia, even Vietnam, the Europeans, the United States, because we're not the only people who are worried about China's choices. China's not just rising this way for the United States. Everybody's experiencing it. The US is just a little sooner into the conversation because of our security um, alliances with Australia, with Japan, with South Korea. We see it at closer range as a Pacific power, but everybody's coming to the same place. We're just arguing right now about how draconian we wanna be in dealing with it. And I think what you already begin to see is cooperation, for example, among Japan and India to create an investment fund that competes with the Belt and Road Initiative, but has uh, human rights protections, transparency of contracts. So what you begin to see is the emergence of more cooperative models among consensual states to compete with the ecosystem China is creating. Do you think that that would change um, China's behavior long term? Oh, I very much hope so, because mm. the alternative to that's really dark for us all. Right. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in on the international picture. I mean, um, Bilal, as, a, as an you know investor, you must see a lot of entrepreneurs from all over the place, including from China. I've, I think that one of the important things in this whole discussion is we're very, very careful to um, to distinguish between the Chinese government and entrepreneurs and and you know people who may visit the U.S. and so on. I think that's oh, totally. Horrible. I I, yeah. I I think Dr. Shaki was talking about it earlier that one of the key ingredients in our entrepreneurial soup is the talent that gets attracted to this country. You know, mm -hmm. myself included, brought in as a student, American government and people paid for my education to turn me into what I am and whatever I can do now for this for this uh, country. Um, but the same thing applies to, to every country. And, and I think, you know, if, if anything, people like myself and others are like defenders of that, you know, we, yeah. we take it very seriously that, you know, we don't lump people together and, you know, stop having, you know, grad students from Iran or, you know, Russia or China or whatever, that'd be disastrous for ourselves. Forget about the human rights elements associated with that. It's just, just from a pure capitalism perspective, this would be a disastrous thing for us. But the second thing to also note is, that innovation does happen internationally, collaborations happen internationally, research happens internationally. You know, there's, you know, there's certain kinds of advanced physics research that you cannot do just in one geography. You need to have a center in Italy and have a center here and measure the gravitational waves and you know, at least so many thousand miles apart from each other. Um, there's a lot of work happening in biotechnology in China. And I think you know, the, the, the fear and the worry is that maybe the ethics are not being applied the same way, but at the same time, you cannot deny that the fast progress that they're making at the same time, partly maybe because they're sidestepping some of the regulatory controls that we have in place in the US. Um, so as, as an entrepreneurial community, as an investment community, we're absolutely looking at innovations outside outside the US. In fact, if you if you notice that the deep tech, which is the area I invest in, sort of you know, high uh, you know, researchy technology that's being brought to commercialization, um, you know, the growth in investments in Asia and Europe in those sectors have been higher than the growth in the US itself. You know, and, and, uh, and there's, you know, it has many reasons for that. One, I think you mentioned yourself that 
other countries are learning from the US and trying to adopt some parts of it. They're trying to create venture capital funds. They're trying to create SBIR type government grant making institutions. They're trying to create you know, uh, visa programs for international students to come and study there and get residency and be able to get work permits. Um, and, and at the same time, it's also that, you know, we, at the end of the day, the most important thing is for startups is to find markets that want to buy your products, right? The, one of the reasons, you know, we, we lost some of the technologies here is because we didn't have large enough of a market that was willing to pay the high enough of a price um, to build those products here. Now we can say in the national security regimen, oh, we're going to spend tens of billions of dollars and create our own fabs uh, for semiconductor manufacturing. There's no reason why these technologies move to other parts of the world. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think we have to really think about that. You know, is that really the right fight to be having? I think we will have to make those choices every single place. You know, do we really want to fight about where the beef comes from and where the corn comes from and where the semiconductor chips come from and where the vaccine was manufactured? And you know, I mean, uh, you, that, that's just impractical in today's world. And certainly for America that consumes products from all around the world. Like, are we okay having a vaccine manufactured in, in Russia? Because a lot of the countries are, and that's the only choice they have right now. Uh, my parents who live in Pakistan got the Chinese vaccine because guess what? U.S. vaccines are not available, right? And it is for the best interest of all of us that they get vaccinated with whatever vaccine is available to them. So I, I think it is a connected world. And what we're seeing right now is, uh, I think Dr. Shaki was saying, this is like sort of an immune response and it's sort of flaring right now. Um, the, some, of, some of it is very real and, and some of the threat that we sort of ignored for a while. Some of it is maybe a little bit of exaggeration. Um, and, you know, politics is playing into it. Everything is politicized the last four years. <laughs> like, you know, a lot of every issue became a political football. Um, but the, at the end game of it is we will have to figure out how to, how to collaborate and work together while pushing for things that we care about, which include having resiliency built into the supply chains that, that feed us, whether it's for PPE or vaccine manufacturing or semiconductor manufacturing or 3D printing. New technologies are coming in all the time that actually make it easier for us to build resiliency into our supply chains. We just didn't pay attention to that in the past because we were just like, whatever's the cheapest, go bake it. I think we're now going to have one more factor, just like we should have environmental concerns and climate factors built into our supply chains, the same way we're going to have national security built into our supply chain. Well, go ahead. Can I, can I just jump on that? Because I think, I think it's a really important point that we are in a globalized world and we will need to figure out how to balance our desire to have supply chain security with other concerns. And the other point that's really important is that is that ultimately this has to be a, an international effort. If part of the concern about, about Chinese tech is not just that it's giving us a very healthy dose of competition, right? It's not, it's not a bad thing to be challenged in terms of technological innovation. And I have no doubt that the United States can rise to the occasion. But right now, some of our instincts are a little bit counter to where we act, what the problems actually are. And, and there are themes that we've been talking about over the last 45 minutes. We tend to want to control and contain and replicate the supply chain instead of thinking about how to disrupt, how to jump to the next innovation level, how to make sure that whatever it is that China's investing in, like think about it, you get to the end of CMOS technology, got a new material, you're gonna start a new paradigm for, for chips. That's the best way to make sure that everything that China's doing to try to catch up to us in terms of ever smaller node production is not gonna work. But if all we do is build fabs, we're gonna miss that opportunity. And in doing so, we're gonna miss an opportunity to advance technologically ourselves in ways that will redound to our economic and national security benefits. So I think that, again, we have to distinguish between what's a, what's a, what's a military concern and what's not a military concern. Building back better, as Dr. Shockey was saying, can't be just about America. It has to be about the world and our partners. And part of the way to think about how to reinvigorate alliances, which is something that the Biden administration is very keen on doing, but you don't hear it a lot in the tech language, is to bring technological collaboration to those alliances so that we're coming back with something new, not just saying, hey, we're back, trust us again. It's like, hey, we're back. Here's how we want to partner. Here are the values that we want to instill in what kind of commercial technology we use for smart cities around the globe so that you don't have to buy 
Chinese tech that's got all these funky algorithms and you don't know where all your data is going, right? Yeah. But if you, if you see that field, then all people are gonna have is what the giant, you know, military civil fused and heavily subsidized Chinese state is offering. So if you're good with, you know, Shanghai knowing about all of your financial transactions because it's actually what all of your citizens are using for them, then that's the world you're gonna get unless you start thinking creatively about how to compete in an area that we never used to think of as deserving the government's attention. We always thought hands off, private sector will deal with that. But we can't really afford to do that now. 5G is the wake up call. It's the canary in the coal mine. And so when we think about values and when we think about national security and when we think about economic uh, progress, we need to start investing in different ways and building new partnerships with the private sector at home because it's a different world. And it doesn't mean that we have to be only adversarial toward China, but it does mean that if we don't adapt, that juggernaut is likely to occupy space that we find deleterious to our own interests in the long run. I mean, uh, well I just, said, Sarah. I just want to put, put, point out one thing that um, is not counter to what you're saying, but I think that the, this um, wake up call has triggered a, a number of things which are in, in their own way, a wake up call to China, right? Because China is, already has a third generation chip program that it's launched. Huawei's been talking a lot recently about 6G, right? I think it's sort of accelerating that competition uh, in, in of itself, right? This, this kind of desire. To, so it, it seems like the, the stakes are sort of um, raised, raised significantly. Um, so what, like we've got 10 minutes left. One thing I think it'd be good to, to talk to talk about is uh, there was a great question actually from the from the viewers, from the audience, about how um, the government, the US government, should look at regulating the tech sector here. Because obviously, there's, this is a, a big issue. It's actually a big issue in China as well, which is interesting reflection. But um, that does seem like a very important question, What, how we should, should think about that when there is, seems like there's this kind of mood of a lot of regulation of the, of the tech sector. But I don't know, Bilal, you're nodding. I, I think you probably- I, 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 I folded my arms. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> and I can talk about, look, um, I, 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 I like to say sometimes that tech sector alongside defense was actually one of two big, big portions of our economy that was sort of ignored for a while in some ways. We let them do whatever they wanted to do. Military, because we were all like stand up, salute and move on. Thank you for your service. And we overlook some of the mistakes they make. Some of them were grave mistakes that led to a lot of losses of life and both strategy as well as operations. And tech, we looked at it as a bunch of young kids eating pizza, coding and creating websites so people can find dates on weekends, right? And, and turns out that we, in that process, ended up creating you know, uh, platforms that have billions of people on it, more than any single country's economy. Uh, being transacted on it, companies that are now worth trillions of dollars, um, and uh, and and actively talk about how they, you know, cause revolutions and change governments in other parts of the world. You know, bearers of democracy, and I mean the words that we used to use with our boots going into countries. You know, we bring democracy to you. We're like, you know, hey, we're Facebook. We're bringing democracy to you. Um, it, when that starts to happen, I think you have to have certain kinds of um, oversight in place because this is now a very big part of our economy. And, and we have to be very careful that what are we regulating? I think the regulation part of it, some of it becomes you're too big to fail. That, that's not right. Some things can only be done at scale. Certain kinds of technologies can only be produced, manufactured and competed with at scale. Uh, you don't, it's impossible to create a car company that only produces 5,000 cars and does so profitably. You have to do with these economies of scale. Maybe one day we'll be able to have a full unscaled economy, but we're not there yet. Um, and the same thing applies to technology. But to the extent that we need to have, as we're moving really fast into both um, you know, uh, human in the loop automation, which is really our Facebook. I mean, it is humans posting things, but there's some automation that happens around algorithms that shows me things that I want to see. And then eventually a full automation uh, AI, machine learning, AI all together. As that's starting to happen, we need to start putting certain processes in place where you can be the judge and the jury yourself. Certain technology companies need, you know, there are companies that, that are available to have provide oversight that, you know, hey, are your algorithms biased? Are they transparent? Are they ethical? Um, they need to be certain 
policies and procedures in place to guide the behavior of some of these companies, especially as they become large enough that potentially have as much or more power than some of the state leaders. Because even before US starts to get worried about this, think about all the smaller countries that can't even do anything uh, in the face of a major social major social media platform taking a certain space mm-hmm. or an autonomous car company and you know what do we do about jobs creation you know in 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 their own economies with that so i think there is some regulation coming unfortunately there's been so much drama around it and so much sort of politicization that there's been an almost like a you know very adverse reaction from the tech community okay so um Let's, let's ask, uh, we're running out of time a little bit. Um, Dr. Shaki, what, what do you think about regulation? I am curious, you know, it's very noticeable that these giant, some very big, powerful Chinese companies have been key to some of their advantage. I'm wondering if part of the, part of the regulation we should be looking at is with an eye on um, competition. Yeah, I think there are two kinds of regulation coming for the big tech platforms. One is, domestic regulation because of concern about damage to democracy at home. Mm -hmm. But another is uh, going to be um, about regulation of what laws these companies obey internationally, right? If the Mm -hmm. Russian government wants Alexei Navalny's text chain, um, are you gonna follow that instruction in order to have a market in Russia? I think the American government's gonna want something to say about those issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's coming for technologies, for big tech companies as well. And it's probably not helpful to them that they're uh, slow in experimenting and not nearly transparent enough. I mean, the oversight board's a great uh, innovation probably too little too late to keep the rising water level that's coming. And let me just say again, the regulation is probably going to be bad the first several iterations because we're not good at having it right. We're good at experimenting and eventually stumbling our way to getting it right. So I think there should be an enormous effort. Oh, one last thing I would say is that most of the technology experts coming into the Biden administration come from one or two places. The, on the domestic uh, front of security for elections and things, they come out of the National Security Agency. Um, and on the international front, Uh, They are people who advocate breaking up the big tech companies. So there's an enormous amount of education that will need to be done by by people just to explain the things that Bilal explained a couple of minutes ago about operating at scale. I think that's not even generally appreciated in the policy process. And so Silicon Valley companies uh, leave this to the policy process at their peril. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sewell. I'll just make a, a brief coda, uh, which is that, you know, when you think about what's at issue in, in tech regulation, many issues are at play, but one of them doesn't actually hinge on uh, tech company regulation. Um, an underlying issue and our own political failure has been around questions of privacy. We as a nation cannot agree on how to think about this issue. And so when we're talking about how to cooperate with our European allies that have far outstripped us in terms of their ability to both articulate and enforce and enforce on us indirectly because it is a globalized world, uh, privacy standards. You know, we, we're at a disadvantage there and that is only going to grow as we try to pool our technology advances. We've got to figure that out if we're gonna be able to share data, if we're gonna be able to Uh, have these platforms and trust in these platforms, whether it's a smart cities or a mobile payment system. Like we can't get democratic tech right unless we can at least address privacy. And that's not even a problem of the big tech companies. Good point. Um, Yeah, I worry that agreeing on any of these issues is gonna be difficult (laughs) to get anyone to do. Um, Let's finish with, we've got a couple of minutes left and um, there was a good question or a big question, but you'll have to answer it quickly. Um, was what's the one thing the U.S. isn't doing or isn't on the radar that, that it should be in order to be more competitive? So um, we'll start with 
Oh, yeah, you can raise your hand very politely. <laughs> Consolidation of North America as an immigration platform, as an energy platform, as an economic platform. We are, that is the biggest overlooked area of uh, potential advantage for the United States that we're consistently bad at, especially in the last several years. Great, okay. Um, Bilal, would you like to- I, I would say, you know, obviously I second that wholeheartedly. I would also say, that there's young population in a lot of our supposedly partner countries around the world that we are not investing in enough. We're not providing them with the education and the technology and the access that, that, that they would, that would appreciate. All they see about the US is the force that we come in from a top down to sort of control their lives and they don't appreciate that. Whereas China comes around building roads and bridges, you can see what, you know, what happens over time. We have so much to offer that doesn't affect our national security negatively in any way, it only accelerates that, but we have chosen not to do enough of that. Okay, very good. Um, Dr. Sewell? My vote would be for a national technology strategy that starts with a net assessment of all dimensions of technology and where it's going and looks at where our competitors are and where our allies are, and then looks at adapting the, the US innovation pipeline um, to make best advantage of it in the national interest. Great. Okay. Well, as, as someone who's getting his um, American citizenship, I would I would vote for all those all three platforms there. So thank you very much. We're going to um, wrap it up there. So thank you, Dr. Sewell, Dr. Shaki, and Dr. Zubari. Thank, thank you. So you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Will.